Now, in our study today, open up with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Uh, we're going to look at a, a particular subject that comes up often. And every once in a while, I have to do a, or I don't have to, but I, I like to do to help saints out a particular topical message. In our regular study, we were going through 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. But I want to take a, 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 a look at something real quick. Now, recently it was shared with me that a famous radio Bible teacher, he mentioned how his father died in a, when he was a youngster, in a, in a, in a very gruesome accident. He was at a mill, a mill, you know, a mill dealing with uh, agriculture, and he, and he died in, in, in an accident. And this particular radio teacher said, he, he said that, that it was because God did it. God basically killed his father or allowed his father to die, but it was God who did that. And he goes on to relate that if it wasn't, in his mind, if it wasn't for that event that happened when he was a young, younger man that God, you know, killed his father or had his, his, allowed his father to die, he himself wouldn't have been a, 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 a preacher, a Bible teacher, a preacher. He's attributing that particular thing in his mind as the reason he himself is uh, or was a, a Bible uh, teacher or preacher, okay? And I, as we think about that, I was thinking a lot of Christendom speaks like that and a lot of religion speaks that way. Today we're going to look at the doctrine of intervention because it's, it's God wants us to understand how he works today. He wants us to get a sense of exactly what am I doing today. Now the Bible is a big book, and there is all through from Genesis to Revelation divine intervention in the Scripture. But what we want to see is, is it all the same throughout? And if it is, how so? And if it's not, how so? Okay. Uh, I thought about something that happened just recently. Um, if you know anything about Mecca, Mecca is the Muslim holy site. Okay, and they're to take a. A, 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 well, at least once in their lifetime, Islamic, uh, Islamic Muslims are supposed to make, if they can, an, an aliyah, they, that is, they go up to worship at Mecca. Well, I don't know if you keep up with things like this, but I do when it comes to the Middle East and religious things. But, uh, you know, how, how uh, Christendom and religion, they always talk about these things. Well, in Islam, at this, at this mosque, the giant mosque there, a crane fell. You know, it just happened this, this week. And it killed, I believe, over 120-something Muslims. And then over 200-something were injured. And when they were interviewing the, 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 uh, the uh, Muslim clerics and so forth, they said, why? Why did this happen? Why did Allah let this happen? Well, said, well it's an act of God. It was an act of Allah. We don't know. It's just, just the way it is. There was a fatalism about it that it was the will of Allah that this crane fell and smashed these people up. Okay? In our insurance we have a clause that says an act of God. Now I find that strange because there is an ancient enemy called Satan, the devil. He hates humanity. God loves humanity. Our father Adam, he sinned when God had given him everything except responsibility not to eat of one tree to show his free will and his reliance on the word of God. He sinned and brought a curse upon creation. But people like to blame God, especially for their bad things. Now I know why, because God is God and he's powerful. And sometimes we wonder why he allowed, and that's the key, allowed. But others think that God caused things to happen. Calvinism and so forth. Uh, even the Muslims I was just talking about, they have a fatalistic view that everything that happens to them was ordained previously by God. Good, bad, or whatever, right? So what is God doing today? How is he operating today? Is he intervening in, in lives? And if so, how? Now, today's study is the doctrine of intervention. Look with me at our text real quick. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Because we will find out how God is intervening in lives today. But there's only one sure way. We can't trust our own minds. We can't trust our own human understanding. Lean not into your own understanding, the scripture says. There's only one sure way to know how God, if he is intervening, if he is, and how he's doing it, and that's the word of God. So look with me at chapter 3. 
2 Timothy 3, look at verse 16. Notice what Paul writes. He says, all scripture, scripture is the holy writ, what we're looking at now, is given by inspiration of God. What that means, it's God breathed, okay? It, it, even though God, remember what we just read? Uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is a reminder to man that God uses man in the earth to do his will, okay? Well, it says, although it was written by man, the inspiration, the, the inspire, you see the word, look at that word inspiration, you see the word spirit there, in spirit? The, the spirit that was behind those words is that of God. And I'm going to stop in the middle of the verse just for the purpose today, and is profitable for doctrine. All right, what's doctrine? Doctrine is particular teaching. If you're going to know something about, if you're going to know anything about anything, the, the number one, the chief authority on that subject is the Bible. The Bible is not a scientific book. It wasn't written to be scientific, but there's science in it. It wasn't written to be a math book, but there's math in it. Bible, Bible numerics is huge. You can see God is a mathematician. We talked about that calendar. God, he, he's the one who has appointments. God has not appointed us to wrath. God keeps an appointment book. He's very meticulous. Okay? But here, what I want to focus on, and it's profitable for doctrine. So what we're going to do is look at all scripture today and look at the doctrine of intervention. Okay? Ryan had a good word for it. He says, an intervention, an intervention, intervention. What do you mean by that? Well, the word intervention, let me, let me uh, I got a little definition here. Uh, the word itself is not mentioned in the Bible. When you go to your King James Concordia and type in intervention, nothing comes up, or even intervene. So I went to Webster's Dictionary, although, by the way, although the word is not there, the concept is, I, let me say that. But I went to Webster's Bible Dictionary, or Webster's Dictionary, he, he, he has a lot of his uh, definitions from Scripture. Here's the word intervention. It means to become involved in something. Let me write this down for you. <laughs> All right. The word intervention. Inter. You see that? Vention. I can mention. To become involved in something. And then they give this par parenthetical clause. He says, Usually a conflict. Usually a conflict. Okay? Usually a conflict. To become involved in something, usually a conflict, in order to have an influence on what happens. In order to have an influence. We'll put that huge because that's the key there. An influence on what happens. Okay? Now, I was thinking about this word. In the, in the lost world, particularly, when you talk about intervention, there's a whole show called Intervention. And what it is, it's people's friends and families, particularly an addict, their friends and family, they, they, they become involved. Now this, maybe not, I guess it could be a conflict. Whatever addiction it was, it's, 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 it's uh, hurting relationships and so forth. So they have an intervention where people come, and they usually catch them off guard and say, hey, we got to, you know, and they try to help them. To become involved in something, usually conflict in order to have influence on what happens. They're trying to influence them by love to get help, right? But then there's another intervention amongst Christendom and religion. And what that is, is that God is directly manipulating every detail of our lives. He's, he's, he's directly causing. Now let me, let me use those words because these are important. Manipulating and causing, okay? You remember like I said uh, last week when that crane fell, here are these people, they're about to do their holy whatever. They're, going, they're making this trip to go and pray to Allah and a crane fall on and kill hundreds of them and, and, and injures many of them. And, and, they, and they, they move all the they guys say, hey, that's just the will of God. You mean that crane fell on me? God wanted that? Yep. In fact, it was so bad. They interviewed one guy who, who didn't who saw it happen, but didn't get interviewed. He said, "He goes, I wish I had that. I was I wish I had died in that plane in that in that crane accident. 
Because then I can know I pleased Allah. You know, I died in the cause and so forth. That's how people think. But directly manipulating and causing is the key. So let's keep going. So in Christendom, that God is directly manipulating every, and the key word is every detail of our lives, or causing everything to happen, that he's in essence putting things together like little puzzle pieces. But here's the key. Therefore, we have no choice nor control over our lives. Now, is that true? Well, let me show you what the Apostle Paul had to say. Go back to the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 17, because it's interesting. The Apostle Paul, he was sent by God to give people understanding. He's the one we just saw that said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Paul tells the, the Romans, you have obeyed from their heart that form of doctrine I delivered you. Romans 6. In Acts chapter 17, as Paul is sent out amongst the Gentile heathen, notice what he says. We, we, you can read it on your own, but I want you to see in verse number 22. He's talking to the Greeks, the Athenians. And they used to go to this place called Mars Hill, and they loved to hear the philosophers philosophize, right? So Paul noticed this, so he goes up there, and notice what he sees here in, in Acts 17, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, these, these Gentile heathens, I perceive that in all things ye are what? Too superstitious. That word superstitious literally means they're, 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 they're frightened about all these gods. They're trying to appease all the gods. And how you know they're trying to appease all the gods, look at the next verse. For as I passed by, by the way, Paul wasn't going to go. He, he, knew, he knew what was going on there. He was going by. And beheld your devotions. He saw them and watched. What they do? The heathen do devotions. The heathen do devotions. I have no doubt when that crane fell, there were probably some doing devotions. But watch this. I found, verse 23, an altar. An altar is where you sacrifice to the gods. With this inscription, to the what? unknown God. <laughs> do y'all understand what they do? They had all these, in the Roman world, they had all the pantheon of gods. Little G. Polytheistic. And just in case they missed one, they had an altar and they wrote an inscription. You know, whoever, the man upstairs, if you out there, this one's for you. The unknown God. And it is that one that Paul says in verse number 23, whom therefore ye eagerly worship, Hey, Paul said that the Jews had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. People are zealous for God. It takes a lot to get, all, get a lot of money and make this trip to worship what you call God. But he goes, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And so the apostle Paul is going to explain to the heathen, that's his job as the apostle of the Gentiles, he's our apostle, how, who God is, and how he operates. So you can read the rest, but he goes on to talk about the God of creation. And lastly, look at verse 31. This is the most important thing Paul had to say, because he had the point of the day. You remember I mentioned how God is a God of appointments? He has a calendar in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained. God ordained a man. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. How does all men know this is, is going to happen? And that he hath raised him from the dead. When the God the Father raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, he now is given assurance to all, and that's what Paul is saying, that each and every one of us today, if you're a human being, you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus and give an account of yourself. Whether it's the judgment seat of Christ for us believers, where he gets an account, not so that we might get into heaven, it takes place in heaven. It is, what are we going to do for the Father forever? What is our job? And the judgment seat of Christ determines that. For those who are lost at the end of the age, the great white throne, it will determine your everlasting punishment in the lake of fire. But God said, Paul, he doesn't want us to go there. He wants us to get saved so that we won't stand at the great white throne going to lake of fire, but that we will serve the Lord Jesus and God the Father forever. You have that opportunity now if you trust him and his shed blood. 
But also, you have to trust what Paul says. So today, what I want to do, we're going to take a trek through the scripture. And we're going to see how God has intervened throughout time and, and, and memorial in mankind. All right? So the two main uses of intervention, well, the intervention is to become involved in something, usually a conflict, in order to have an influence on what happens. Who better to do that than God? You think you got an influence? You got that right. But is God manipulating and causing? And if so, is that how he always does it? Okay? That's what I want, we're going to see. Now, in time past, God did intervene with the people of the Bible, whether it's Adam and Eve, he literally appeared to them. He spoke to them. Cain and Abel. Enoch. God, Enoch was walking with God for 365 years and he was taken out. He was taken up, okay? God took him. He intervened. By the way, what made me think about this too is God is going to intervene again very soon in the lives of all of us if we're believers. That's what the resurrection rapture is. The Lord himself will actually come and, 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 and descend from heaven with a shout. And we'll be caught up. He's going to intervene. But all through time, I got some more uh, uh, times. With Noah, before God flooded the earth with water, he intervened in Noah and his family's life and said, You build this ark, and I'll save you through the flood. Everybody else died. With Abraham, he says, you listen to me, you get out of Ur of the Chaldees, leave your fathers out, go to this land, trust me, I'll make you great. I'll make, I'll make you a blessing, and through you and your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Islam, Christendom, and Judaism all respect one man, and that's Abraham. The three major religions, I call it Islam, Christendom, and Judaism, all of them respect this man. When God says, I'll make your name great, billions of people on this earth right now honor the name of Abraham. Now, it should be the Lord Jesus. One day it will. But right now, Islam, Judaism, and Christendom all honor Abraham. God made that happen. Okay? The people of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they come from that man. But one day, in the kingdom, believing Israel will rule and reign over the Gentile nations and bless the world. God's not doing that today, we learned from, from Paul. But Paul was a Jew, the Lord Jesus was a Jew. Even what God's doing today originated, and, and most of the body of Christ in, in early acts, the early infancy of the church, were Jews, okay? When I say Jews who got saved, they were Hebrews. The point is, God made that happen. It's going to continue to make it happen throughout time and memorial. So he did intervene. At the Red Sea, when God through a mighty hand, judge Israel's, uh, excuse me, Egypt's gods, those ten plagues on their gods, that they had gods of everything, and God was just judging them, and he brought them out through a mighty hand through Moses. But when they got to the shores of the Red Sea, young men, old men, young women, old women, children, cattle, sheep, millions of people, millions of animals, they stuck there, and here comes Pharaoh and his army, God tells Moses, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And he opens the Red Sea, allows them to go over, and then here come the Egyptians and flooded them. One of my senior ladies, she says, I'm not sure if there's a God. I said, well, well how did Israel come out of Egypt? I said, they were slaves over there. Let's think about this. Slave labor is free labor. Civil war was about that, even in our country. Slave labor, Sarah Farrell didn't one day just say, hey, stop doing this stuff, just go on out with your people. He was forced to do that because God put those plagues, including killing his firstborn son. The Passover, that Passover we talked about, that first feast day where God passed over. And those who weren't covered by the blood, the, the houses of the, the uh, uh, Israelis that weren't covered by the blood, the, 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 the death angel killed their firstborn. That's what Passover is all about. It was before the law. It was God's calendar. But anyway, how, I said, so how did they get out of there? She says, well, you know, so whatever. She, I, I said, then how did they get over the Red Sea? She says, oh, that was just an earthquake, and it just moved the waters over. <laughs> I said, so all these millions of people, even old people, they all in them. Mm -hmm. I said, what about Pharaoh and his army? These strong men of Egypt, mighty men of war of Egypt, on chariots and horses. What happened to them? Well, they got drowned. 
well, how is it they got drunk? See, it, she wasn't thinking. She goes, oh, I never thought about that. People don't think about that. That's what I'm saying. No, God did. He intervened. Let me show you something. If you have been around Christendom, maybe the last 15, 10, 15 years, there was this thing called the Prayer of Jabez. Every once in a while, these books come out, and God is going to bless you. Go back to First Chronicles. Go back to First Chronicles. Let me show you something. Um, it's a famous thing. You know, every wind of doctrine comes through. Go to First Chronicles, and um, it was called the Prayer of Jabez. There was there, there was a whole movement and uh, books and stuff. And basically, let me let me show you what it is. Go to First Chronicles chapter four. I'll give you time to find it. First Chronicles chapter four. This one was interesting because a whole book and movement was built on a couple of verses. And what it was, was this desire for more from God. Health, wealth, prosperity. That's huge. Who doesn't want to be wealthy? Who doesn't want to be healthy? Who doesn't want to prosper? I know I do. We all do. So it's an appeal to our natural, it's the natural desire. Okay? No human being just said, well, I want to be sick. I want to be poor as dirt. Po. We said, no, we can't afford the O and R. P O. Po. Who wants that? Nobody. And so this was used. Let me show you. Look at 1 Chronicles 4 and verse 9. 1 Chronicles 4 and verse 9. And Jabez. The movement was called the Prayer of Jabez. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I, I bear him with sorrow. Well, she did exactly what God told Eve. You know, multiply your sorrow and your perception. Verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, and it may not grieve me. And God granted him what that which he requested. Now, I can see why this was popular. Because everything in there, I pray to say, well, let's go through that. Oh, that thou will bless me indeed. What do you want to be blessed by God? And nothing wrong with this. And enlarge my coast. By the way, I'm going to show you what that means in a minute. And that thine, might, thine hand might be with me. The blessing of God, his hand. God's strength with you. By the way, I love this one. And that thou wouldest keep me from evil. We live in a world where we can't even worship God freely as far as you do what you want to do. Let me do what I want to do. I won't harm you. You don't harm me. Just leave me alone. The world wants to in, in, entrench on you. They just, just attack, keep me from evil. Let them heathens have what they want. Just keep me in peace. Right away. That it may not grieve me. Exclamation part, uh, point. I get you, bro. And the part of the prayer of Jabez movement that really matters is the last part, the last uh, sentence. And God granted him that which he requested. And so they take that to see, you just have a prayer of Jabez and God. But you ever ask yourself why he even prayed that prayer and why it says so simply that God answered it? Because that was part of a promise that God gave to Jabez and the Hebrew Israeli people. Go back, if you will, to Deuteronomy. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 19. Because what we're going to see is that when God did intervene, particularly in time past, particularly with Israel, his people that he chose, Deuteronomy chapter 19, when he did intervene, it was based upon some promises that he had already gave them. It wasn't some nebulous thing that God says, ah, okay, I'll just grant your request. I'll grant yours, maybe not yours. No, no, no. God made promise, covenant promises with the people of Israel, both the nation as well as the individual in the nation. God deals with them as a na national, national as well as individual. Jabez had particular promises that God gave because he was faithful to God. Look at Deuteronomy 19, verse 8 and 9. Moses already told them before they even got in the land. And if, verse 8, and if the Lord thy God enlarge thy coast, as he hath what? Sworn unto thy fathers. These folks knew that down at time immemorial with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the, 
God says, I'm going to enlarge your coast. I'm going to give you the lands of these Gentiles. Just trust me. I'm going to give you the land. Well, here's the rest of the verse. And give thee all the land which he, what's the next word? Promised to give unto thy fathers. And it was conditional, verse 9, if thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, Jabez did that, to walk ever in his ways, Jabez did that, then shalt thou add three cities more for thee besides thee. And then he was going to, my point is, even that prayer of Jabez was based upon something that God told them through Moses. It was a promise, covenant. God would, and he would intervene. He would become involved in something, particularly conflicts because they had to fight their enemies in order to influence what happened. God had angels come down, fight them. There was an angel killed 185,000 Israel enemies. He had other angels, uh, chariots of fire and so forth. He opened up people's eyes. Oh, look at that. We thought we were alone. Look, God is with us. He intervened in their affairs. But they still had free will because later in second, uh, later in in, 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 in David's in David's life, when he was on the run from Saul, David went to seek refuge, and he said to God, he said, "Hey God, now that I'm here, will Saul find out find find out I'm hiding here, and will he come down to get me?" God said, "Yes, he will." Okay, number two, Lord. When he gets here, will the men of this city hand me over to, to Saul? Or will they fight for me? Oh, they're going to hand you over, Jack. David said, wait a minute. Saul's coming. They'll hand me over. David thought about it. Don't like those odds. I'm out of here. And he left. Saul didn't come, and obviously they didn't hand him over. Why? See, David didn't have a fatalistic understanding of things. David, who was a man after God's own heart, understood that God gave humanity choices. God didn't even stop Satan from speaking to Adam and Eve. I was reading something uh, when I look about these Jews and see what they think about stuff. This book of Jubilees that the Jews, uh, one of their, it's not scripture, but they, it's about their history. And, 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 and for a long time immemorial, they believed that when God created man and animals, that both had the ability to speak. And that when Adam and Eve sinned against God, the animals lost the ability to speak. And here's, here's, here's a couple things that's interesting. It says that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman. In Numbers, Balaam, a prophet, was hitting his donkey. And the donkey turned around and said, what are you hitting me for? I've been good to you. You can read that in the book of Numbers. Balaam wasn't even surprised the donkey spoke. It was almost natural. And lastly, you see, they, even in our day, like a parrot or a cockatrice, and they can mimic man. Polly want a cracker? Polly want a cracker? What did Ryan say? What'd you say, Ryan? Did they say? They uh, say, help uh, him, help teach him. Help trapped in a parrot. Teach him, <laughs> teach him. You want to Somebody turned me into a parrot or something like that. Teach your parrot to say, I'm, I'm, help, I'm trapped in a, in a parrot or something like that. Or, you know. <laughs> but, but where is that at? So they believe that happened. But I'm, I'm showing you that things are different today than even that they were before the fall and so forth. Many things different. But God is always able to intervene in the lives of his people. It's how he does it. That's why we're looking throughout time. He intervened. You can, you can study this on your own. In Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, we were just in Deuteronomy, it, it's, it's called the law, okay? That's the first giving of it. This is the second giving of it 30 years, uh, 38 plus years later when they're about to go in. When, when they first came out of Egypt, they were, in, they were in the wilderness 40 years. God gave them the law in Leviticus and Exodus and, Deuter and Exodus and Numbers and so forth. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law was when that next generation, one generation died in the wilderness. So when those little ones grew up and went in with Joshua, they had to be reminded of the law. In those laws, it was cursings, earthly cursings, and earthly blessings. I can't even go into all, but you go read on your... God says, if you do this, Israel, if you do this, I'll bless you. If you do this, I'll curse you. When God says, I am God, I create evil, 
And that atheist say, ha, 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 you serve a God. He created evil. See, see, see. You got to look. He was talking to Israel. He created evil for them. Yeah. Because according to the law covenant they made, they said, okay, Lord, we'll take it. We'll take your blessings. I guess we'll take your cursings too. We want the blessing. See, when, when, when they weren't listening to God, he intervened and used Gentile heathens and, and the, the elements. He, he, didn't, he didn't give rain and so forth. They had famines. They had disease and pestilence. God created the evil because they covenant with God for the evil. Just like they covenant for the blessing. So when God did intervene with Israel, it was because he had this relationship with covenant with them. Okay? Earthly blessings and earthly curses. Uh, curses and blessings. All right, let's keep going. Look at Deuteronomy. You're in Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy 6. Go back to Deuteronomy 6. So let's just look. We'll take a couple of minutes here, and then we'll, we'll see how God operates today as far as intervening, intervention. <coughs> In Deuteronomy 6, look at verse 22. Deuteronomy 6, verse 22. And, and Moses is reminding these people before they go in to the land. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. As Israel in their experience with God, he did these things, signs and wonders. Uh, I have a study out there. You type in Pastor Ron Knight or something like that and say signs and wonders or miracles. I did one a few years back. Even the signs and wonders, that's because Moses was in unbelief. God says, Moses, you go back. You go back and tell them, I am sent you. They'll believe you. They'll believe you. He didn't give them one. He didn't give them the, 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 the serpent yet, the, turn, the rock turned the serpent, the, the leprosy in his hand and all that. Nothing. He just said, go tell them. I sent you. They'll believe you. Moses said, oh, God, I can't talk, man. They won't believe me. I killed somebody. I think, who? Are they gonna? He says, I made your mouth, man. And by the way, your brother Aaron is on his way. He'll be your mouthpiece for you. Go back. But before he did that, he says, what's in your hand? So he gave him these two signs to show them. And then he says, if they don't believe the first sign, do so Israel was born out of signs and wonders. And so now they're looking for signs and wonders, signs and wonders. Let me show you here. They want God to intervene. Look at Joshua. Go over to the book of Joshua. Right after Deuteronomy, Joshua 24. Look at Joshua chapter 24. He reminds them. Joshua's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to take them into the, the promised land. Moses didn't take them. The law won't do it. They need the new covenant, the new one, Joshua and Jesus, same name, to take them in. Notice in Joshua chapter 24, verse 17. For the Lord our God... He it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which, and which did those great signs in our what? Sight. You know they walked by sight. And preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. So God intervened in their lives. He brought that nation out. He kept them for 40 years. He says, your, your shoes didn't wear out. Your clothes didn't wear out. Forty years. He made oceans of water in the wilderness. You can still see them over in Saudi Arabia today, where where that split rock, sixty feet up, and you can see where the water flowed out. It's, just look up Split Rock Ministries. We have the technology to see it. Still there. God intervened. He promised their fathers. That's why when you read passages like this, go over to one book to Judges chapter six. Go over to Judges chapter number six. When you're reading about Gideon, why do you think when God came to Gideon, Gideon couldn't believe nothing? Because he goes, man, we getting our butts kicked by these Philistines, these Palestinians. Listen, God, where you been, man? We've been looking for you. The nation of Israel with that stuff going, oh, y'all don't, that stuff going on with Iran and, and the Muslims around them, and all that stuff is the stage being set for those last days of the prophetic program, man. The enemies of Israel's Muslims want to destroy them off the land. Well, they've been doing that for time immemorial. So then a battle between Isaac and Ishmael, the sons of Abraham, over the land. And literally God has to intervene. The Lord Jesus Christ, before these people are wiped off through nuclear warfare, he's going to have to come and stop. He's going to intervene. 
But first, he's going to intervene in our lives through the rapture. God has not appointed us to that wrath. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. And why are they in that trouble? Because according to Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy 28, they're under the cursings of God because they rejected his son, the Lord Jesus. But look at this man Gideon, this mighty man of God. Watch what he says. Uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 13. Start at verse 12. No, it's verse 11. I like this. Here we go. Judges 6, 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah. You see that word Ophrah, that, that, that place? That is said where Oprah Winfrey's grandmother, she was reading this passage, and this is the name they named little baby Oprah, but she didn't spell it right. That's where she got it, right there. Oprah. She, uh, she left the one of the H's out or something. Well, I heard that Oprah changed it to Oprah because people mispronounced it so Oh, much. is that right? She so, okay, changed. so there's a lot of this, but it, it, the origination was this right here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But notice it says, that pertained unto Joash the Abir's right and his son Gideon. Now, watch what his son Gideon did. He, he threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. These Gentiles would, would come and take everything Israel had. So that guy's back there hiding this stuff, doing this in secret. And the angel of the Lord comes and said, Gideon, I got something for you. Now look at the next verse. Verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. See how God saw him? Gideon didn't see himself that way. Look at the next verse, verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, man, this is a great question. Why then is all of this befallen us? He's saying, look, man, if we're the people of God and God's with us, why are we sitting here in poverty? Why are we worried about our enemies just destroying us? Hey, Israel's going to be in the exact same place in the future. God, if we're your people, you give us our temple. Make Bless us. Where, where are you? The Lord Jesus is in that, pair, when he, that, that instant when he falls asleep. Yeah. Lord, awake, O oh Lord, the psalmist said. That's Gideon. Why, why are we in all this trouble? Look at the rest of verse 13. And where be all his, what? Miracles which our fathers told us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, and so forth. Listen. Now the Lord hath forsaken us. Gideon is saying, if we are God's people and he's with us, why isn't he intervening? Where are our miracles? Where are our wonders, man? Help us, Lord. But wait, there's more. Go over to one more. Look at Psalm 74. Go over to the book of Psalms. Psalm 74. Look what the psalmist said. Psalm 74. When I, I talk to Muslims, I talk to Jews. I read the Quran so I could talk to Muslims. I talk to Jews, talk to Mormons, those witnesses, you name whatever religion. Really when I talk to Jews, I say, now, if you think you're the people of God, where's God? Why are these Iranians, they're going to get a new, we just, we sanctioned it. They're going to get one, and they're going to blow you guys off the map, man. They're going to do it. Where's God? Where is God? Where is he? Here's people. Let me show you what the psalmist says. Psalm 74, verse 8. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. These are the enemies of, of Israel, particularly now. It, it, that was local prophecy, but immediate, but this is far the reach of prophecy of what's going to happen in the Middle East even today. When I say today, in the future. What's, what would the stage being set? What they're saying in their hearts when they made that pact and say, oh no, we, we're just going to use it for peaceful energy, they're in their hearts going, we can't wait to get the This is put the thing going to destroy Israel. That's what they're thinking in their hearts. Let's keep going. This is the Bible. Verse 8. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. You know who's keeping Israel from building a temple up there? Templeinstitute.org. They got it all. They all read it. They got the they got the priesthood ready. They got the priest. They got all the stuff for the temple. Got the crown, the, the gold crown for the high priest. They're training these men up in the law. They just last week built the altar, the altar of the Lord. And they're saying, we're just waiting for Messiah to free us because if we try to go up there on that temple mount that, that where those Muslims at, it will cause world, world War III. And they're right. 
I see these times, these Jews would try to take lambs up there and, and it'd be a fight, man. <clears throat> I let them do it. But the Antichrist, he's the, that Muslim Antichrist is going to say, I got you. I'll keep them off your back. Go ahead, build your temple. Bring all the Jews from all the world over. Yeah, bring them all over. Bring them all over. Worship, worship your God. And he's going to do it to the show. But the psalmist says, as he thinks about how God is allowing his, 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 their enemies to prosper, look at verse 9. We see not our what? Signs. There's no more any prophet. Did you know that God went 400 years without talking to Israel because of their sin? He says, you will be a famine of my word. The reason John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness, they hadn't seen a prophet from God for 400 years. The Messiah is on the way, he said. For in the year, there's no prophet. Neither is there among us, verse 9, any that know of how long. Lord, how long? The point is this. Israel and that intervention with God had to do with what he covenanted with them. And when they were persecuted, they realized God's not with us. We don't see his intervention. Now, the Lord says, the Jew, excuse me, he says, the Lord says in John, except you see signs and wonders, ye will not believe to the Jews. Paul says about the Jews, the Jews require a sign. Tongues are for a sign. One of the reasons God gave tongues was a sign to them which believe not, Paul says. So, with the time we have left, how does that differ today? God intervened throughout humanity, but then when he, when he got his, 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 his people, his nation, Israel, he promised them he would intervene in their lives through mighty signs and wonders. What about today? Does God intervene today? Well, the short answer is yes. But, hold on, how does he intervene? How does God become involved in something that doesn't always have to be a conflict, but even if there's a conflict, how does God become involved in something in order to have influence on what happens? It's a miracle. Well, let's, let's see that. Because again, the only person really we can have to teach us that is the Apostle Paul. Now, I want to say this before we end. Let me erase all of this. As I was thinking about it, I'm going to give you two words. Oh, uh, Jada Lynn put that down. That's the cross, Jesus, God, yeah, the love, okay? When it comes to God's working today, people confuse and conflate two different principles, two doctrines. There's the doctrine of intervention in Scripture versus, this is probably what most people think about, providence. Okay? Providence. The providence of God. Now, if you can see, there's a, you see that word provide in there? Provide. What I've seen over my time in the Grace Message, now nearly 20 years, People confuse and even conflate these two principles. There's a difference between these two things. Because one is direct. One is indirect. It's no less God working, but it's how he's working, okay? Whereas with, with Israel, God would just do something supernaturally that no man could no man could make happen. Come on in. That no man could make happen. But we're going to see from the Apostle Paul. Let me let me show you something. Um, the way God dealt with Israel, as well as the early church in the Book of Acts, is different as far as how He deals with the body of Christ today. And we're just talking about today. Even when Paul tells us in Romans twelve that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, okay? You've heard people talk about the permissible will of God, okay? Permissible. We're going to talk a little bit about that before we end. Now, God's will, okay? God's will. God had a will with Israel. He laid it down in Scripture. God has a will for the body of Christ, or for, for mankind today, let me say that, all the Gentiles. And according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God has a twofold will that all men be what? Saved. Salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, shed blood of Calvary. 
And then secondly, after you're saved, what you guys are doing now, hopefully you all are saved. If you're not, hold on. I'll give you the salvation message at the end. It's, it's really simple. It's simplistic. Well, he wants you to come into the knowledge of the truth. Of the truth. And that's what I want us to look at as we come down to him. God does not deal with us in fatalistic terms like those Muslims say, oh, it's the will of God and he just killed all of us, you know, with the crane. God has a will. See people saved? Knowledge of truth. Not everybody gets saved. Not everybody comes to knowledge of truth. The permissible will of God allows, that's his will, but he allows us to have free will. Free will volition. And not only that, for members of the body of Christ, he deals with us as adults. So if we're saved people, he deals with us as adults. He, he, gives, he lets, out, lets us make choices to choose the path. Sometimes people say, hey, look, nobody has a more precious, compatible wife than me. Chris and I are, are, are like one soul, like Jonathan David, but man and woman. Interesting. Compatible, chemistry. She's thinking, I'm thinking, just boom, same thing. But I didn't just sit in my house saying, oh, God, give me a woman, and she knocks on the door. <laughs> I, I used the resources that were available, again, God's providence we're going to see, and sought Christian Cafe, and sought a woman, first of all, Christian Cafe was the name of the thing, so I, I had my mind, I didn't meet her at the bar, in the, in the club, the club in the hood, I didn't meet my wife there. And then it, it, it narrowed down, I asked you this question, kind of narrowed it down, and she did the same, and it was through providence, because we had the same mindset, and so, so there were different things. God didn't just supernaturally cause this relationship or supernaturally cause any relationship. It is thinking process from the, the, the truth on her side, my side, and everything we do, free will choice, that God and his providence. Now, let me show you what providence is in the scriptures. Although intervention or intervening was not in the Bible, the word providence is there. If you go with me to the book of Acts, go to Acts chapter 24. Go to Acts 24. I just want you to see if the Bible... You, if the Bible uses a word, you want to look at that first. Dictionaries and all that, especially the Webster's, is pretty good. But first, look at let the Bible define it. And, and a lot of times, the Bible will use words continually, you know, more, more than once, even though this is only used once. And then the context. So you, that's what study is. But let me show you the word providence. You see the word provide in there, right? Let me show you something. Acts chapter 24, verse 2. Some, some little smart lawyer guy was trying to, trying to prosecute Paul. Verse 3. We accept it always and in all places. Most noble Felix. This guy goes on, rambles on. With all thankfulness. I'm sorry, verse 2. I'm, that was verse 3. I'm about to follow it. Verse 2. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse Paul, him, Paul, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy what? Providence. Now I normally don't do this. When people go into the Greek and stuff, usually they want to tear it down. When I when I do experiments to build it up, but it was interesting. I just found it interesting. Because it was only used once, but I wanted to see how that word was used in other ways, okay? I'll show you that. But it's the word, it's interesting. Because it's, 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 you'll see why I even done this. I do know we don't do this, but it's the word pronoia. Pronoia. What's you ever heard the word paranoia? Where people are all paranoid and, and worried about every little thing. Well, that word means to take forethought. For pronoia means like pro act. Forethought. Okay. Keep, keep, keep this in mind. Forethought. Or to think beforehand. To think beforehand. Now why this is important? Because when we talk about God's providence, He has already thought things through when He created both man and particularly the body of Christ. He, he had forethought, pro-thought. He thought beforehand. So when we talk about providence today, 
God doesn't have to manipulate and control every little thing in our life because he has put in a system that if we do it the way he said it, things will work out the way he wants it to. You get that? We can prove what is that good and accept the perfect will of God. But I want you to see that. Now watch this. Whereas he dealt with Israel like children, they were called the children of Israel. I have to control my six-year-old. Chris and I literally have to plan out her day. <laughs> Tell her what to do. Boom, 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 boom. You got to do that with teenagers, okay? But with adults, I say, honey, pick out something nice for me today. She always does. Chris is, she's blessed that way. She's that way she's little. I don't have to say, let me make sure you got it. No, I say, hmm? I trust her. I trust her. Because I know we on the same way. She wants to make me presentable so that I can. So the point is, with God, he has put forethought and he thought beforehand how he's going to deal with humanity, particularly in the dispensation of grace with the body of Christ. Okay? So I want you to see that. And although his perfect will is that every person saved, nobody goes to hell, he still allows free will volition and people do. Most of the world rejects Christ. And then even of the saved people, most of the body of Christ don't know a thing about the mystery of Christ and what God is to say to Paul. We do, but they don't. They, they didn't choose that. Therefore, the bad stuff that happens both to the world and both to the body of Christ when it's not lined up with the will of God, it's not God causing those things, fatalistically cranes falling on people and smashing people to death. No. It's not God causing this, that, and the other or making that happen. He has provided a way. Go with me to Galatians chapter 6. Let me show you something about a spiritual law. If I had to narrow down how God operates today, and then I'll give you specifics. But, but a generalization is Galatians 6, okay? I wrote this down. Uh, oh, by the way, by the way, I think uh, the Webster's Dictionary definition of providence is divine guidance or care. Pretty good. God does guide us. He does care. It's how he does it today. And in Romans 13, 14, let me read that for you. You can go there if you want. I'm just going to read it real quick. Romans 13, 14 is the other usage of that word pronoia. And here it is right here. Romans 13, 14. Y'all get this. But put not on the Lord, excuse me, you want to put them on. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not what? Provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The word provision is that word right there. Same as providence, provision. Don't put for your flesh stuff out there to make your flesh fulfill that lust. Don't make provision for the flesh. Don't supply its needs. All right? Now. Go over to Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse number 7. Galatians 6 verse 7. Verse 7. Be not deceived. Who is not mocked? God is not mocked. I know people mock God, but really, let me let y'all know. He's not mocked. For whatsoever a man, ah, soweth, so, that shall he also what? Reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. What God is saying is just the way, I was thinking about a farmer. Dear Brother Les Feldick, I love him because he's, he's a farmer and he uses these great analogies like the Lord Jesus Christ in an agricultural Israel would use the sower, souls, the word, uh, the seed. Just like there are natural laws, natural laws or principles God put into humanity. So if you want to eat, God supplies the seed, the soil, the sunlight, the, the, the water. Dude, you, got, you have to choose to plant that thing. God ain't going to come down and plant the seed for you. He ain't, let me tell you that. He provided it, but you, Adam, you toil, you take care of the garden. By the way, when you do all that, he not gonna, you're going to have to plant, you're going to have to reap. That plant is sown, you have to reap it. Then when you get it, God's not going to make it into bread. You have to make it into bread. And when you do that, you can lead a horse to water. You make, you're going to have to feed yourself. Over in 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul says, if a man doesn't work, 
neither shall he eat. Now, God wants man to live, eat. Man should not live by bread alone, but out every word proceed out of the mouth of God. We're going to see that in a minute as we end. But God wants man to eat, but he says, if you don't work, neither shall you eat. He was saying that to his children, believers. I'll provide, you sow, you reap, you harvest, you make it into bread, and if you can't do that, you get a job where you can pay, and then somebody else is the market. God's not going to do everything. You, he provides, but he lets you make choices to do his will. Well, in the same way that spiritual principles happen, excuse me, natural laws of sowing and reaping, there's a spiritual law. And God has put into humanity, the, the world, spiritual laws or principles. And it's sowing and reaping. Let's look at that again. Let's look at that again. Verse number 8. Galatians 6, verse 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. By the way, God is not causing and manipulating bad stuff to happen to people. Satan, the curse that Adam brought, please blame Adam, don't blame God. The acts of God, that was the acts of Adam, Satan, the person, the curse. The last person in that line, if you want to blame people, is God. God loves you. He died for you. He loves you. Satan hates you. Come on now. But it's the act of God because people want to always blame God. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. Now how do you sow to the spirit? To sow to the flesh is you give the flesh what it wants. More, more, more. Give me, give me, give me. So to sow to the spirit is what the spirit of God wants. You say, hey, let me do that. And the only way you know what the Spirit of God wants is through the Word of God today. He's not going, shh, shh, let me tell you. If you hear something spiritual whispering to you, let me tell you, it ain't, say, it ain't God, it's Satan. Or it's some devils. For real. Because what did we learn from Paul? Go back to, go back to uh, second, uh, second Timothy. We'll end that in, in, in here. Go back to 2 Timothy 3. Israel were children, were babes. Even the prophets God sent it was to bring them back to his written word through Moses. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God shall man live. That means God has to give us every word. Where do we find every word of God to live? For you and I who speak English, it's the King James Bible. Like these brothers here, they speak Korean. He has a King James that was translated into Korean. So you can take it and translate it. The Textus Receptus, the, the received text, the Antioch text, the, the text that was used to, to, uh, for the King James Bible goes all the way back to Paul and the believers. That's the right line of manuscripts and text. So a King James Bible, number one. You've got to know where to find the Word of God to live. As we come down to, conclude, uh, to the end, I start thinking about what's up with this when people confuse direct intervention and indirect intervention or a providence. Because we want to feel special. We want to have that special connection, that special thing that makes us different. That special. But can I tell you, how more special can we get? Ephesians 1 says we're accepted in the who? The beloved. Paul says in Ephesians 1, when you're saved, you're accepted in the beloved, right? This is my beloved son. Somebody said, Ron, what's the greatest description uh, uh, that you can give to someone else. I say beloved. Because God himself, when he looks at the Lord Jesus, says, my beloved son. And if we're accepted in his beloved son by faith, positionally, we are special to God. He has a great plan. He's going to take us home. We're going to live in heaven with him. We're going to serve him. Unlike Israel, you don't need this experience to... God, listen, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Of the spirit, you reap life everlasting. That's now. That's not your future. That's now. And if you do things the way that God, through Paul, says, so you need the right book, the Bible, the King James Bible, if you speak English, or it translated into other languages. And then you need to rightly divide that word. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. God's will is that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. God has made it so that every man has a spiritual journey. Let's, uh, let's get a couple of pastors as we end. Thank you for your patience. Go to Hebrews chapter number uh, 11. Go to Hebrews 11. 
will end in Paul in 2, Timothy, uh, 2 Corinthians in a moment. In Hebrews 11, let me show you a principle that is consistent throughout, from the beginning with Adam to the last verse in heaven. Verse number 6, Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, what's faith? Believe in God's word, right? Faith cometh by hearing him by the word of God. For, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, and, and that's God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. You've got to believe he exists. But look, the next thing, and that he is a, what's that next word? Rewarder of them that seek him. Diligently. See, I left that out. God wants you to respond to the light that he gives you. You're getting light today. God's going to hold you accountable. Whether it's your conscience, Romans 1. Whether it's the creation, Romans 1. You, mankind begins a spiritual journey because God put into every human being a, 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 a void. He put in the sons and daughters of Adam a void of, of God-shaped vacuum, as they say. And, and they, we fill it with something. We're supposed to fill it with the living God through the Lord Jesus. God's will will have you going in that direction. Now let me deal with this before we end in 2 Corinthians. When we say that God's will as revealed in the scriptures and we get to know what he has to say in the scriptures, is that limiting God? Sometimes people think, oh, that's limiting God. You can't limit God. He's bigger than a book. I can throw this book in the fire like that guy did in the book of Jeremiah. The guy tore out God's word and threw it in the fire like he's getting rid of it. God told Jeremiah, you know that guy threw my word in the fire? Yeah. Come here, Jeremiah. Write it again. God wrote another copy. And he said, now add this to that guy. Add this punishment and curse to that guy who did that. You can't get rid of God's word. He's bigger than his word. God is bigger. But he has chosen to reveal his will and his word to humanity today through a book so that we can have scripture, holy scripture, to trust. So that you won't go to the left or the right. Nobody, you'll know for sure what God has to say. Everybody needs a book that we all can check for ourselves. He's chosen to do that. He's bigger than book and ink and paper. But he's chosen for mankind to reveal himself today through the scripture. You remember that radio teacher that I started with who said that God killed his father? And if it wasn't for God killing his father, he wouldn't have been a preacher. God didn't kill his father. God didn't kill his father. And I thank God that in that man's spiritual journey, although he had a zeal of God, not according to knowledge. I don't want people blaming God. I'm glad that his spiritual journey ended with him at least saved. Now, the sad part about that, the man is deceased now, but he never taught the rightly divided word. Maybe he's saved. Who knows? Well, yeah. I mean, what am I saying? Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's your assumption. Hopefully, we pray he is. That's the other side of the coin, though, yeah. is that people blame God for the effects of the curse. The right. effects of the curse are random. The effects, the effects of the curse are random? It's not God causing and so forth. Yeah, right. You, as far as this, the guy I was telling you about, the, the Bible, I, my assumption that we say, but he may not, I don't know the man. But what I do know, listening to him, he didn't teach Paul's message. He didn't teach the rightly divided word. Why didn't he go on responding to the light of God? So I'm saying, when you do all that stuff, when you're looking for these outside things, especially blaming God for bad things, at the, I mean, at least give him praise for the good things. The point is, we have a standard objective standard to understand what God's doing, and that's the scriptures. Rightly divided. Just like God dealt with Israel under a certain covenant, he deals with us Gentiles based upon pure grace, and it is Paul the Apostle that teaches us what God's doing today. Get two passages as we end. Get um, 2 Corinthians, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5 and 2 Timothy 3, and then we'll end. 2 Corinthians 5, and then 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians 5 and 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Notice what Paul says to us in the body of Christ. It's a real simple passage in verse 7. Now I'm not going to go into all the things, but you can read it. But notice what he says. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Israel walked by sight. We see not our signs. God, God's word is to be believed. So we walk by faith today, not by sight. Okay? Go over to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. When God finished the mystery given to the Apostle Paul, Paul in his last book that he wrote says, now we have all scripture, okay? 
And just like God provides natural laws, and He wants you to be blessed, He wants you to live and have food, you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't work and study the Word of God, you won't prosper. You won't understand. He's not going to plant it for you. He'll give you the seed, the Word. He gives you the seed, the soil, and all the other things. The stuff. But you have to plant it. You have to harvest it. You have to work, work with God and make the bread and then eat the bread. And if you can't do all that, get some, somebody else to do it for you. You pay them to do it. The labor is worth its hire. But the point is that not everybody has to do it and not everybody will. Um, well, the, spirit, the spiritual law is the same. It's the law of sowing and reaping is what I want to say. Give me one second, Ron. I'm going to finish this up. Okay, look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, Notice he says, for instruction in righteousness, you'll have your instruction. In verse 17, that the man of God, and that includes you too, ladies, the man of God may be perfect. Now that's not sinless perfection, but perfect in the Bible means truly furnished unto how many good works? All good works. God has given us a book we can trust. He's given us an apostle to understand how to rightly divide that book, what, what distinctions are in that book. He's given us the body of Christ, people like me and you guys, to teach other people. That Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I understand this except some man guide me? And with humility, he allowed another man to help him, someone who had already been before. That's my job, to help people understand God's word. So God has provided a book, an understanding how to divide that book properly, rightly. He has provided people who are going to do the good works that God has ordained, members of the body, if they if they listen to Paul, people like us, to help others. And lastly, if you truly understand that spiritual sowing and reaping, you will reap that life everlasting that God has for you, okay? God has put it in His Word. He's given us the Spirit of God to, to, to take and make these things come to life in our life. And that spiritual principle of sowing and reaping will work in your life, okay? We just have to believe it. I'll end with this verse. Romans 5, 2 says, By whom also, speaking of Christ, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We access the grace of God by faith. Does God intervene today? Yes. It's through the provid His providence. He has put everything that we need to, to do His will, to know His will and do His will, so that we might prosper in and through His will, okay? But it starts with salvation. If you're not saved, like Ryan said, I, I was assuming that the preacher said, but I don't know. <laughs> but what we can, you can know for sure. If you don't know for sure you have that everlasting life through the Lord Jesus Christ, don't leave here without knowing. Or don't, when people, he's going to post this tonight. People are going to watch this. Don't go another second. The Lord can come any minute and take the body of Christ home. I want you to be with us. Because what's on the other side of the rapture is the wrath of God on the world. Yeah. You don't want to be a part of that. You could get saved today, but if the Lord does come now, you'll get in. Bam. Just like that. By the skin of your teeth. The grace of God. And if you're saved today, and the Lord does tarry, let's redeem the time learning the message of the Apostle Paul, growing, because the judgment seat of Christ is coming, and he's going to judge how we lived our life as believers. Let's use it by doing the work of faith. Doing the work of faith. That's a work, man. Planting that seed in our hearts. And then believe in it, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's the word of God that affectionately works in you that believe. God's word will work and it will bring forth the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the praise and glory of God. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can get into your word, Father, each and every day. But what a blessing it is to come with those of like precious faith, knowing that in your providence you haven't left us alone to just wonder about your word. But you do have other saints in the body of Christ who can help us understand your word. If man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word to proceed out of the mouth of God. Number one, we have to have your every word, Father, that you have for man. But we have to know how to process it. And thank you that we have a book that we can trust. We have precious saints, your, your little remnant, who can help us understand your will before you come here and take us home. Most importantly, thank you we have your son, Father, that no matter what happens in this world, there's that hope that 
whether the Lord comes or, 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 or he tarries, we have his life. And once our life on this earth is done, we're going to live forever with you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for that blessed hope. We pray, come, Lord Jesus. We look forward to you coming. And we thank you for this time together. We ask you bless our time of Q&A as well and our time of celebration after. In Christ's name, amen.